We're always pursuing something, growth, gain, more. But in ourselves, what might it look like to actually pursue obsolescence, the act of becoming obsolete? It sounds so counterintuitive, but I do know, if I recall, Jesus was fairly paradoxical in all of his teachings. So it's like, there's something about saying, okay, I'm not taking myself so seriously, and what might it look like for me to step back? The Mission Matters Podcast is a partnership between 1615 and Missio Nexus, who have a shared passion to mobilize the people of God to be a part of His mission. Well, hello and welcome once again to the Mission Matters podcast. Normally, I would be introducing my good friend and co-host, Ted Essler, but Ted is traveling abroad. I don't know if he's in Africa or Asia, I'm not sure, but he's racking up those points, I'm sure. Uh, Ted and I have this ongoing conversation about how many countries we've been to. And I've been to over 50, and I think Ted has got me beat by 25 or 30. So he's going to come back and add some notches to his belt. But please pray for Ted for just a fruitful ministry as he travels abroad. But I also have a good friend of ours. He's a good friend of mine personally and Ted as well. Yeah. Rob Wassel is with us today. Rob, how many countries you been to? I, you know, I'm not after hearing 25 and 50, I'm not even answering the question. It's embarrassingly low. I think it's probably 15 or 16. So yeah, not too many there. Well, that's probably more than most people. So travel is an important piece of growth, right? I think health permitting, we all need to get out of our perspective once in a while and see the world through God's eyes. I love it. Yeah. I love, I love travel. What's your favorite country? I'm curious. Gosh, it's crazy, right? I've been to over 50 countries and mm. it seems that wherever I'm at, I really mean this too, wherever I'm at, I just, God gives me affection for the people and the place. Mm. But it, I, I think my favorite is Mexico. I mean, I live in New Mexico and Mexico is just mm -hmm. south of us. I just think Mexico mm. is a beautiful place for so many reasons. How about you? What's your favorite? <laughs> Oh, gosh, same. Uh, I love everywhere I go. But I think there's something about Egypt, um, in particular, visiting the cave church. It's just an epic experience. So, yeah, that's probably one of my favorite places. Well, I don't think we're going to catch up to Ted anytime soon. So no. he, he may take his <laughs> victory into heaven. <laughs> yeah, he probably will. I'm sure there are others, though, who have who have eviscerated his his numbers. Right. I mean, 50 is great, but I'm, I'm sure we've got folks who are at. Uh, a substantially higher number. Well, Ted. for clarity's sake, I'm 50. I think he's 75. Oh, right? he's, oh he's, is he? Okay. okay. He's, but still, I mean, there's probably a few out there that are higher than him. Yeah, no doubt. Well, Rob, um, man, so glad you're here today. Why, why don't you let us know who you are and what you're up to? Okay. Yeah. So obviously my name is Rob Wassel. It's actually Robert Wassel. I think my wife started calling me Rob and I don't know how that, where that came about, but all that to say, um, so I serve at Pioneers, uh, which, as you probably know, is a mission sending agency. Uh, my official title is CSIO, Chief Strategy Innovation Officer. So I started SEEDS, uh, which is the Global Innovation Lab, and then another team called SI, Strategic Integration. And, um, and then I also work here. In fact, I actually spend most of my time as an internal executive coach. Um, and then I have a business on the side as well that I do a substantial amount of executive coaching with CEOs and VPs of uh, for-profit and non-profit businesses. All right. Well, one of the things we're going to hit on is coaching today. But before we dive into that, let us know um, about your most significant challenge or problem and why it was so significant to you, Rob. We're going to set the stage for hmm. this conversation. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, so I've been at Pioneers for almost 18 years. This April 19th, would you believe, is, would be 18 years. Wow. Um, I've had eight different roles here. Um, eight specific roles. And one of the roles in my sort of first 10 years, literal tenure, <laughs> was um, uh, senior VP over advancement. So I was doing all the fundraising. Um, so I managed the fundraising team and also built relationships, very good friendships with a lot of our key partners, foundations, high net worth individuals. And I was traveling quite a bit, as you can imagine. In fact, I was on the road probably three or four months a year. Most of that was domestic, but, you know, overseas two to four times a year as well. So that um, that is a pretty significant uh, load to, to carry. But the backstory before that is that I was in the Navy. I actually went in the Navy when I was 17. My parents signed for me to go in the military and uh, served there for three years uh, working on aircraft. 
and actually was um, stationed on the Nimitz for six months. And I had a back injury, got out of the Navy, had a variety of roles in uh, business and industry and ministry. Um, and for 20 something years, actually, I think it was probably close to 27 years, um, was seeking, you know, medical attention for a back injury. And, um, I mean, when I say medical attention, I mean, like over the top, I've probably mm -hmm. seen 25 different, uh, physicians and surgeons. I've probably had 150, 200 x-rays, 25 MRIs. I've had everything from, you know, injections to you name it. And um, I had this one physician who said, quit coming to me. He was a back surgeon. He's trying to figure out why I was in so much pain. And um, he said, just quit coming. And I was at a point, Matthew, and this is really important in my story, I think, where I was experiencing an unbelievable amount of pain. So just, I mean, I would wake up in the morning. My routine was I'd wake up, I'd take two Advil, I'd take a shower. Then I would stretch for two hours. I would walk and stretch for two hours, get back, take another shower, um, come to the office. I'd take Advil by uh, noon. I felt like I had the flu by one, take Advil at four again, go home, um, exercise for another hour and take more Advil. And then I'd go to bed and not sleep. And that routine got worse and worse and worse. The pain got worse. And so exacerbating uh, that was the travel. Right. And so I, um, I came to the point where I thought in my head, and this is sort of a private conversation. It's interesting. Actually, I'm, as I'm saying this, or as I've probably told two people this, maybe, maybe three, I was literally thinking in my head, I'll probably need to go on disability in a year or two. Mm -hmm. That's how much pain I was in. And three hours of stretching just to be able to come into the office. I was wearing a sock, like a heating pad sock around my neck everywhere, like a literal sock, mm -hmm. um, with rice in it. And, um, and uh, one day I was thinking about, I, I thought I need to, I need to take a sabbatical. I need to figure out what's going on. I couldn't travel. And uh, one day a guy uh, came here, his name is Roy, and he and his wife wanted to figure out how they could serve the organization. And I found out that he had done um, a, a lot of coaching of leaders in major transitions. I was asking him like, hey, what's your background? And the Lord told me right at that moment, like, hey, I brought him here for you. Um, and so um, I connected with him. and. Um, I, uh, I started a process of working with him because I, uh, and I, you know, got a sabbatical. So I was on a sabbatical and, um, and it was just, it was that inflection point. I went to Mayo Clinic and got diagnosed with this really strange and rare autoimmune disease called ankylosing spondylitis, which is like the fusion of my spine, my hips and chest. And so that inflammatory pain creates just incredible or the inflammation creates, you know, incredible pain. So um, I, I went through this process um, of trying to really determine, like, Lord, what are you doing uh, with my life? It was it was a crisis in one sense, a crisis of belief, mm. um, crisis of finance, a crisis of practicality and a crisis of purpose, I think, because, um, you know, I was asking, OK, I'm doing something I can do. Um, I'm doing something I love to do. Um, uh, and, um, and yet I was, it was literally being stripped away right in front of me. Mm. So I think that was probably the biggest, the biggest challenge. And it, it's this cumulative impact of what had been happening since even when I was 17 in the Navy. Wow. Well, I hear your story and I certainly can't fully relate to the pain that you've lived with. But um, we'll talk about this later. You happen to be coaching me right now personally, and I'm headed into a sabbatical not too long from now. So Ted had a sabbatical last year. I'll have one this year. So Ted will be filling in the gaps. You'll be hearing from him solo and, of course, guests. But um, I'm going into shoulder surgery tomorrow, as you know. Yeah. I've got yeah. a rotator cuff. And sleepless nights are real mm -hmm. hard. Um, sleep deprivation is a type of torture, if I'm not mistaken. It is. So, yeah. <laughs> man, it really is brutal. So you, you went through this, you brought a coach on what, what impact that did that have on you? Yeah, it was profound. It was very hard on several levels. And I'll say, by the way, I am an expert on beds. I bought eight beds in 18 months. Okay. So, and some very expensive ones, by the way, and return them. But if anybody needs help on beds, uh, <laughs> Get in touch with Matthew. I can help you. Um, no, really. Like I, I know you name it. I know more about that. Brother, than you. you're a complete <laughs> renaissance man. I no, mean, it's so weird. It is. Is that like not the weirdest, most random thing to know something about? <laughs> like, anyways. Um, no, I mean, I think for me, the experience was it was profound in that 
you know, there was a carving away piece that had to happen. Mm. And um, it's not that there's something wrong with you. You know, I think that's the key thing. I think as God is constantly refining us, um, you know, your pack can only carry so much. <laughs> you think of like, you know, the, the, maybe the, the good analogy, the coach is the Sherpa and I've got a pack on, but you've, if you're going to go up the mountain with that pack, um, and you're going to add things that God wants to bring into your life, you have to empty that pack. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that process was a bit of stepping, uh, into ambiguity, uh, being comfortable. I- I'll tell you, one of the hardest things was when I was in sub- on sabbatical, I would, I would go to this dock. And it would be a 20 minute walk to get to the dock. And then I would stretch for like an hour and a half and I'd walk back and I would go by a, a community that had like a gate on it and watching strangest thing. Let's tell you something about my psyche, watching all of these cars line up to leave and go do something hmm. while I'm, I'm asked to do nothing was one of the absolute hardest things I've ever done. Because of course, I'm thinking back in my head, everybody in the office is moving forward, they're progressing, they're doing things. And I'm being asked to literally put, not even put my car in neutral, but just shut it off yeah. and let it cool down. And um, and so the process for me was incredible because you know coaching a lot, coaching is a lot around decluttering chaos, right? So, our, you know, think about the systems that we function in. Um, they demand so much from us and there are so many inputs and so that process began with just quieting down and and getting decluttered so i could hear um it involved things like defining real non-negotiables for me as i step back into whatever god called me back into and that i didn't even know i mean that was also hard going back to work knowing I'm not going into what I'm going to do and I have no, I cl- no clue what I, what I am going to do. Mm. Um, and so that was really difficult. It, you know, thinking about this idea of a calling was also very hard. That's why I say it was a bit of a crisis, not just of, of mm. practicality, but philosophy. Like what is the macro meta narrative that calling I'm being asked to, to empty myself into has just been, been stripped away. So I think there are lots of, there are several different ways. And maybe later we can talk about that, that why people get into something like that. It's not just because there's a physical crisis and they need uh, a restoration, you know, but for me, the toughest part was, was stripping it away, moving into neutral and then waiting. Mm -hmm. Um, That was very difficult because, you know, we're in a society and I'm the kind of person that just, you know, wants to keep moving. And like I said, the system demands so much from us. Um, that we feel like we're not being true or not measuring up to, um, you know, to what is being asked of us. Yeah. As I hear you talking, Rob, of course, I'm in the midst of this right now and you're even walking me into it, but it's so much about our identity, right? Who are we? And of course we know it's so easy to find our identity in achievement, uh, Mm -hmm. our identity in ministry in fruitfulness and all those things. But our identity has to be in Christ. And, um, you know, I'm seeing you at the dock and I know those times are coming for me. Mm. And there's a verse that's been heavy on my heart for a long time mm. um, in, a, in a missions context, but it's relevant here too. It's Psalm 46, 10, you mm. know, be still yeah. and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Mm. And I do a teaching on this at one of our consultations we do for agencies for mobilizers who are mostly working too hard and their identities in numb, you know, how many people are responding and all those things. And, and so um, I, I I share this with them and I'm preaching it to myself right now, but be still the word means cease striving Mm. or or, or, or slack hands. Mm. Um, Stop and know that he is God. And I love the continuation of that. I, Mm. you know, I'm going to get the job done. You, you, you yeah. don't need to fret. You don't need to worry. And so even as you're talking about this, of course, I'm wrestling with my own identity after being involved mm-hmm. in globalization for 30 years. So I imagine I've got some big lessons coming my way as mm-hmm. I slacken my hands and know that he is God. Yeah. So, brother, we're talking about coaching here, and I, I know it's ubiquitous today. I mean, there's a coach for everything. In fact, there's a missions coach. If you should need one, just contact 1615. <laughs> <laughs> but in your context here, um, can you quickly define coaching for us? 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I often like as a cursory comment, I'll say it's helping leaders confidentially intersect the unknown future. Now, that's a pretty ambiguous statement itself. Right. Um, but I think about, you know, even Psalm two speaks of this connection between the rightness of the path we're on and our capacity or ability to, to gain and then leverage wisdom right, to actually appropriate wisdom in our life, right? The, the rightness of the path is correlated to our ability to get that. And so I think for me, as, I'm, as I work with uh, folks like yourself and others around coaching, um, I mentioned earlier this idea of, of carving away. And so, I, in fact, when I started this business a few years back called Tecton Executive Coaching, the word Tecton, it's an interesting and strange word. Um, and Jesus was actually, I did not know this somehow in this scripture referred to as a tecton, as a carpenter, mm. a tecton. Mm. So it's someone who's carving away to make something new. Mm. And so I thought that's a pretty profound imagery, uh, which is why I called my business that. Um, and it's this idea of, of chipping away something to see what, what God is going to uncover, right? What, and it's a discovery process. And so I think it's important to understand coaching is not consulting. Uh, coaching is not mentoring and coaching is not counseling. So those three areas are different lanes, right? Consulting, I can do consulting, but I do consulting all the time around strategy, innovation, change management. Um, cons- this idea of, of consulting moving into the business space is not, is not coaching. Mentoring is often like, Hey, here's my experience, you know, and I think you should go this way. Um, and then of course we all, we all know what, um, what, um, uh, why am I drawing a blank? Um, <laughs> counseling. We all, of course, every guy draws a blank when the word counseling is about to come out of his mouth. <laughs> like that thing, that thing everybody keeps telling you you should do, counseling. Um, so it's not those. It's a distinction. So yeah. I think the power of coaching is found in having a trusted advisor that's absolutely confidential. Um, that you can share it with that's t- basically walking alongside you on a journey of self discovery, again, chipping away and discovery to see what might be something new. So when I work with folks, I work with them along three lanes. And I like to say, you think of a three lane highway, I like to say we kind of dip between all those lanes. The first is this idea of what I would call mapping somebody's DNA. So it's essentially well, think about your life. So Matthew, if I asked you about any elements of your life, 2017, 2012, 2003, what have you, you could tell me what those pieces of the puzzle look like. And often it's like a thousand piece puzzle, the complexity of all the things that you've done, all that you are, all the things you love, the things you don't like, the environments you work well in, um, core values that you have, things that are like super non negotiable, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. All of those things, your relational capital, make up this picture. But often when we dump that thousand piece puzzle on the table, we don't have the box top. We don't really know how it all fits together or why it fits together. And so what I do with folks is I help them, as I said, sort of map that DNA out, like create an image of all that they are and all they got is done so that they can look through that image into the future as a lens through which they can make uh, better choices. And so sometimes I'll coach folks around what I call alignment because a lot of people, and I would say probably, well, well over 50% of the folks I work with um, would say that there is discontinuity between who they are, their DNA, and how they're showing up every day, right? Their contribution, if you will. Uh, to the role or to the kingdom. So there's two circles and they used to overlap at one point, but they've drifted apart for some reason or another. I think some of those reasons, like think about my example, that's an internal reason because a sheer force knocking me off my feet, like the physical reason. Um, but then there are external forces as well, right? The role might have changed. The bosses have changed. The vision has changed. My interests have changed. Um, my needs have changed, right? Today I have two in college et cetera, et cetera. So there are financial needs that are different today for people than they were eight or 10 years ago. And so a lot of the work will be around mapping the DNA and then sort of figuring out how might we under the will of God, right? Of course, this is absolutely critical. Like, Lord, should this be good and pleasing to you? How might we create better continuity between Mm -hmm. how I'm showing up, my contribution and who I am? So that's one area. That's one way that that looks. And, um, and I think for, you know, for me, that was probably part of it. And I think for a lot of folks, that's actually what it 
that's actually what it looks like, mm. um, regardless of what it is, regardless of what the reason is that somebody might enter into a coaching relationship. But so that process of what does it look like? That's lane one, um, mapping somebody's DNA, looking into the future, and then reimagining something that God might be calling them to, creating a strategy and closing the gap between those. The second lane, um, when folks that I work with um, – start, they'll fill out some information that I'll ask. And everybody has areas that they'd say, hi, I could use some coaching around this or that or the other. Mm -hmm. So that's the second. And then the third lane is every single time uh, something comes up, <laughs> right? So um, uh, there's a problem uh, on the horizon. It's pretty immediate. And so I sort of bounce around those three lanes. But at the end of the day, it's not about what I want for you. It's about me walking alongside you to discover something interesting, something creative and something novel that God might be moving you toward. Um, and so that's that. I don't know. Is that, does that help um, paint yeah. a picture of what that looks like? I think so. I imagine there's types of people that you work with, things they're dealing with. Are there some archetypes, you know, uh, of the people that you serve? Yeah, sure. Well, I described alignment, right? That idea, that's probably one of them. Another is I would call it scale. There's actually nothing wrong. Um, if you look at some of the most successful entrepreneurs and business owners today, they have a trusted advisor. They have an executive coach working with them, not because there's a problem, but because they recognize the value of just having somebody there mm -hmm. to walk alongside them to discover wisdom, right? Um, and so that idea of, I call that, I would call that scale. Um, a third idea I would call growth and growth is so sometimes I would be, I would be hired by a CEO who says, Hey, coach my entire C-suite, like all the VPs or senior VPs, what have you. And that happens. And there may be growth points that those VPs or the, or the CEO would say, Hey, um, I want everybody to be able to grow in these areas. Um, but often we all recognize our own areas of growth as well, right? Like I know mine, you know yours. Mm -hmm. And so we'll coach around growth. So you've got this idea of alignment. You've got this idea of scale. Things aren't going poorly. Um, they're going quite well. Um, and then you've got, again, this idea of growth. But there's also this concept of transition. Um, I'm working with a couple leaders right now. One CEO who's transitioning out of, out of a position that that individual's been in for many years. And it's just sort of an open book. How do I discern my next move? How do I discern at this stage of life um, what I may be moving into? So that's transition. Some people aren't leaving an organization, an NGO or a company, but they, they know that they've got to transition internally out of a role. So that's the fourth area that I would say is probably pretty critical. And then um, like what we're doing, this idea of renewal, that'd be the fifth. Yeah. Um, maybe it's a sabbatical, maybe it's not. But at the end of the day, um, everybody needs renewal. Renewal is, mm -hmm. you know, think of the, the day seven, <laughs> the Sabbath, yeah. um, seven years in the field and it needs to go fallow for a while. And so mm -hmm. we all need renewal. So it's not just that, hey, there's a problem. I need coaching. Often it's around those different areas. But I would say this. I, um, I work with uh, men and women, number one, both, um, that are... Um, I'd say maybe teachable is probably not the right word because teachable implies I'm teaching, but I'm, I'm not. Um, maybe humble, right? They recognize the value of, of a collective for wisdom. Um, and typically they're, you know, I don't know if this is the right term or not, high performing, they're successful. They've got success in their wake. Um, I, I don't work with people that can't get out of bed, you know, that, that, that can't get to work on time. Like, you know, those are, they're just, they're, they're lovely people. They're just not my, you know, I'm working with folks who, who have got some sense of, of, of purpose and drive and they're moving, they're moving forward. So those are always archetypal ar archetypes of folks I'll, I'll partner with in coaching. Yeah. You talk about that renewal piece. Of course, that's the piece I'm stepping into. But as you've already yeah. mentioned, there's some overlap on the other pieces as well. Uh, yeah, I've got 16, 15, 20 years old, and this is my first semester, mm -hmm. which I'm sure is mm -hmm. too long to wait for this type of thing. But, you know, yeah. God's timing yeah. is right now. And so I'm stepping into it. And another verse I've been hanging on to is, is when Jesus tells his disciples after, you know, 24 seven ministry, he says, come away with me. Mm -hmm and rest a while. I've always loved that invitation. And, and I look at myself stepping into this and 
man, I'm going to rest a while, Rob, and I'm, I'm glad you're yeah, going to be guiding yeah. me through it. And I really appreciate the the fresh eyes, the objective perspective. I mean, I've only just begun to fill out some of the, you know, content that you're going to be looking at. And it's just helpful. You know, we, we do missions coaching and we often say we're not consultants. We do consulting with churches. Yeah. Yeah. We want to draw vision out of them. We want to help yeah. them discover where they're at and dream about the future and help them in some ways to come up with their own conclusions. And as I hear you describing what you do, I think it's very similar. There's you know quite a bit of parallels there. And so um, I'm looking forward to you know the, these several months together as we work through this stuff. You know, Rob, um, I want to think about our audience right now. Yeah. So primarily missions leaders. These are going to be missions organizations, no doubt. Um, missions leaders in churches. Some of these are professional executives. Some of these folks mm. are lay people. But this idea of uh, of spiritual wholeness and vitality, mm. when, when I think mm. about what you're doing, that's really mm. so much of it. It is just people understanding who they are, who God is, all those pieces you mentioned. Mm. How, how would someone listening know, like, you know, maybe I need this. There's some indicators going on in my life that maybe I'm nearing burnout or, or whatever it might be. So speak to our specific audience. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I think some of us know we need it. Often it's precipitated by a crisis. Um, so that's a bad place, right? Obviously, we don't want to get to crisis to realize mm -hmm. I need help in something or I need clarity. But it's not always a crisis. And in fact, often... It's more of the, the, the slow burn, like the slow burnout, the, the frog in the kettle. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, th there are, I mean, think about all the reasons why people burn out, right? So they're, they're grinding hard to make uh, more money. So finances are a big piece of it. Um, the reality is most people I know absolutely lack margins. So when I do um, consulting around strategy and innovation, this is going to sound really strange. I think you might have heard me say this before, but like we teach if you're if you're a, a VP, we teach 20 percent margin, complete white space, like complete white space, not make up space to do your email, not make up space to do um, catch up on X, Y and Z, but margin to look into the future. And um, it's almost impossible for anybody who's managing a, a very demanding structure, team, organization system. But I think people burn out often because of a complete lack of margin. And I would say, you know, I work, I walk through folks through this exercise to consider the roles you play. And um, I won't go through the details of it right now, but when you think about all the roles you play. So for you in particular, Matthew, you play the role of a father. You play the role of a husband. You play the role of a, a CEO or a leader, right? A churchman, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and often what happens is when we're so invested in one or two of those roles, everything else is compromised greatly. Mm -hmm. And so stepping back and asking God, Lord, am I actually uh, stewarding and contributing well mm -hmm. to all the roles you've called me to? Most of us, if we're honest, would say, no, we're not. Um, and it's not a matter of balance or imbalance. I actually don't like the concept of balance. I prefer the term integration. Like, how do I have more of an integrated approach? Yeah. But I think if you, you're asking yourself, Hey, how do I, how do I know I might need to, to, to either take a sabbatical, work with a coach, et cetera, et cetera. Um, think about your level of exha exhaustion. Talk to the folks that know you most, your, your, your spouse, your close friends, uh, colleagues. Think physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Like, am I physically where I need to be? Am I actually stewarding my body the way I need to steward it? Am I stewarding my emotions? Mm -hmm. um, think about the area of conflict in your life. Uh, is conflict increasing in your life? Are you feeling more stressed, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera? And then the chaos, um, the level of chaos that most of us are managing is untenable. And I think it is an issue of stewardship. We step back and we say, okay, what is the higher good? Is it about doing things or being? And obviously God allows us to, to, uh, to do things to see his name glorified. But at the end of the day, um, I think several of us have stepped into this place mm -hmm. of um, human doing, <laughs> not human being. Um, and it becomes the higher good. And so, um, yeah, there are probably a hundred reasons besides conflict and exhaustion and, and margins, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, I think for me, it was helpful to get 
uh, external input to say, hey, where am I at? Where do you see that I'm at? And then to take an honest assessment and say, is this, you know, is this the place that God has called me to be at? Is this really the sort of ideal state that I need to be at at this at this stage in my life? And I think the older you are, you've heard me say this, the older you are, the more frequently you need to check in. Um, you, as you get into you've you've probably read from strength to strength or heard about it from Arthur Brooks. You know, he asks a profound question. Uh, how many Thanksgivings do you think you have left? And I was joking with my brother, just turned 58 the other day. And I said, you guys are going to be 80 in 22 years. And then I realized I'll be 70 and 15. And then it sort of smacked me upside the head. And um, yeah. and so, I don't know, there's something deep. You know, you were talking about Psalm, what was it, 40, um, what did you mention? 4610. Okay. Yeah. So I was thinking Psalm 39, oh, Lord, show me the number of my days mm -hmm. and show me how fleeting is my life. You know, that it's a hand breath, that it's a vapor. That is either helpful or haunting depending on on your approach. And if you think it's haunting, then it's time to to step a, a, take a step back. Because the, the goal is show me the number of my days, like make me mindfully aware, painfully aware of the brevity of life so mm -hmm. that I'm spending myself, like every day God pours into me and I pour myself out, that I'm pouring myself out into the places that I should be. And, um, and I think that's where, like, when we step back, we realize, man, I'm pouring myself into way too many things that don't, don't matter. Well, wow. that's a profound reality to come face to face with. Well, you're ministering to me, even as I know you're ministering to our audience here. But, you know, one of the things I'm hearing, it, it might be a good reason to get a coach is if you're taking yourself too seriously. And I'm yeah. not trying to browbeat anybody because, you know, I think we yeah. all wrestle yeah. with this. We love our mission. I mean, it's a it, it, it's the greatest cause. It's the grand narrative. I mean, it's the master story of history. It's easy to pour yourself, heart, soul, mind, strength into it. But at the end of the day, God doesn't need us. Yeah. And I, I think that's something that, you know, he's taught me several times throughout my time in ministry. Yeah. Um, you know, as I've thought about who I am and my identity and, you know, the mission we should take seriously but once a day, we become a drooling sack of sand. We do nothing but lay on a bed. We started yeah. talking about beds. Yeah. Once yeah. a day, mm. we lay on a bed and drool or whatever you mm. do when you're sleeping. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. want to. Okay. But whatever, whatever's going on and you wake up and I wake up and the kingdom grew. God yeah. still yeah. was doing his exactly. job, you know. And of course, I'm preaching to myself right now. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's interesting, you know, Matthew, I think I told you this before. In fact, I know for a fact I did. And I was just looking at a picture. I noticed it was October 2022. And I wrote this. I wrote a comment up here on this blackboard behind me. Hmm. And it was this idea of the pursuit of obsolescence, that it's a it's a, a less appreciated uh, discipline of believers. Like, what is it like? Let's flip the script for a second. We're always pursuing something, growth, gain, more. But in ourselves, what might it look like to actually pursue obsolescence, the mm -hmm. act of becoming obsolete? It sounds so counterintuitive, but I do know, if I recall, Jesus was fairly paradoxical in all of his teachings. So it's like there's something about saying, OK, I'm not taking myself so seriously. And what might it look like for me to step back? What are you laughing at? What are you laughing oh, at, just, Matthew? You're ministering to me, brother. That's all there is to it. I'm like, oh, well. Are you like, um, you must have a gift of like intuition or something. <laughs> nah, you know, no, nah, I don't know. I don't, I doubt it. I don't know what I have a gift of, but I'm just, you know, the, I think the point is, it's like, okay, like you talked about positioning, posturing, you know, we're so, our, our identity is so tightly tied into the teams. Uh, we have the things we built, products, flows, systems, so forth and so on. Um, but like you said, you know, the kingdom's going to grow without you. Um, and, and in fact, often it grows more without me. And so uh, what might it look like to put myself in a position that actually forces me to rely on God mm. rather than one that gives me an option? Yeah. Right. And so and and what a better way than to to step back and actually trust in a unique in a unique way. And yeah. that begins with what needs to die. Right. I mean, we you know, this lab is called seeds off of John 12, 24, unless a kernel of wheat fall to the ground and die remains a single seed, but if it dies, it bears much fruit or many seeds. Yeah. And so I think that whole process begins with what needs to die and what needs to die starts by turning the camera back on myself. Yeah. Yeah. So 
again, going back to scripture here, mm. you're talking about obsolescence. And I was, I was mm. thinking of John the Baptist mm. and, you know, his, his earthly ministry is coming to an end. He's becoming obsolete. He's mm. been the front man, you know, the, the, mm. the forerunner and his disciples are all upset because mm. they're no longer following John. They're following Jesus, and and he goes, he they they go to John and complain. Basically, our our church is, you know, if if, if you will, our, our church is going away. Our our, our church is shrinking. Yeah. Everyone's going over there, mm. and you know, he he was obsolete at that point, and he said his delight came from hearing the bridegroom's voice. Yeah. And you know, again, I think so much of our our identity is wrapped up in ministry, and you know, for those followers of John that was the case you know they didn't they didn't understand yet and John knew no it's not about me and of course even what he says it obsolescence right he says I have to decrease so that decrease decrease yeah. I mean the exactly. whole idea it's like yeah. that's that's yeah. what this is about yeah yeah no yeah exactly there's so many scripts I mean the first will be last just as a basic <laughs> principle there's so many things that teach yeah. us that uh, that we need to do that. I love that. I mean, that's a that's a really good example. That that um, I must decrease. And so, what does that look like, right? I think that's the challenging question. What does it look like if I'm if I'm actually honest with myself? Mm -hmm. I mean, most of us, you know, I've learned like there are levels of honesty <laughs> with ourselves, um, and then there's a true de deep level of honesty that's really only uncovered, I think, through through prayer. And, and discernment of the scriptures. Like, again, when we turn the lens back on ourselves and we see ourselves for who we really are. Yeah. Well, Rob, I'm sure um, you've ministered to folks on this call and some are probably thinking, I I'd like to know more about this. I I'd like to have an idea of what this could look like for me. So how would folks get in touch with you? Email is probably the best way. Um, my um, email is Robert Global. Global G L O B A L, although it's not that many, many countries, Robert Global 777 at gmail.com. Well, brother, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, um, and likewise. I'm going to have the joy of walking or you walk alongside me. I walk alongside you for several months here as I go into this season of rest. Hey, just, just don't be too hard on me. Be, be, be like, uh, be like a gentle surgeon, please, right? <laughs> A gentle surgeon. You're funny. You're funny. No comment. No comment. Um, aren't you the bodybuilder? You're the. You're like a hardened, you know, civilian Navy SEAL, Matthew. Yeah, I'm pretty yeah. soft on the inside, though. <laughs> you are. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll go easy. No, I'm looking forward to it. I'm trusting what God's going to do with our time. So, yeah. Thanks for the time. I, I appreciate you. it, folks. Thanks for tuning in today. We'll see you next time. Before you go. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. The Mission Matters Podcast is a partnership of 1615 and Missio Nexus. Check out 1615.org and missionexus.org for more resources on the mission of God and the matters of the mission. The Mission Matters Podcast is hosted by Matthew Ellison, President of 1615, and Ted Essler, president of Missio Nexus.